Chapter 15, A Plan Evening was coming on now. Kenny's ears ached from the cold. He picked up his pace. By the time he got to the main plaza, he had worked things out in his mind. Dune and Lena weren't where they usually were. They weren't where they said they were going to be, either. No one seemed worried about this, so that meant Dune's father and Mrs. Murdo hadn't happened to talk to each other lately, and that meant that Kenny was now the only person who knew this secret. So the question was, he thought as he crossed the plaza, where most of the shops were closed and only a few people hurried toward home, should he tell anyone that Lena and Dune were missing? <clears throat> Probably he should, but then, on the other hand, it was clear that they were missing on purpose. Maybe he shouldn't give away their secret? Or not yet, anyhow? From around the corner, by the town hall, came someone walking very fast, who stepped right in front of Kenny, and had caused him to dodge sideways to avoid a collision. Oops, said the person, sorry, I didn't see you. It was the girl named Lizzie. Kenny knew her just a little. She was a friend of Lena's, and she was one of the few people he'd ever seen who had hair the color of apricots. Though right now, her hair didn't shine the way it had in the summer, and her face was pale, almost bluish. Oh, it's you, Lizzie said. I heard you were sick, said Kenny. Are you better? I am, Lizzie answered, but I almost died of it. I coughed so hard I cracked one of my ribs. I thought I was going to cough my lungs right up out of my chest. She looked at him rather proudly. That's too bad, said Kenny. He was thinking. Should he tell Lizzie about Lena and Dune? It felt wrong to tell Dune's father and Mrs. Murdo, who would be upset and alarmed. That felt like a betrayal of whatever Dune and Lena's plan was. But it was hard to keep the secret all to himself. He needed someone to talk it over with, someone he could trust. Could he trust Lizzie? He knew she'd been the girlfriend of that boy named Tick, who had deceived them all. But it wasn't her fault she'd been deceived by him. Everyone had. Lizzie turned to go. Kenny hesitated another second, and then he said, Have you seen Lena lately? No, said Lizzie. She looked into the air, thinking, I haven't seen her since... It must have been three or four days ago. Why? Well, listen, Kenny said. He took hold of Lizzie's scarf and pulled her around the corner, where the wall kept them out of the wind. Here's what I just found out. As he explained the mystery, Lizzie listened with avid interest. So did Torin, who was hiding behind the stump of a tree that had burned last summer. He had decided he was sick and tired of being left behind and sick and tired of being left out of secrets, and he'd followed Kenny into town and ducked into his hiding place when Kenny ran into Lizzie. He thought the mystery of Lena and Dune was not only interesting, but also infuriating. Once again, people had gone off on some kind of adventure without including him. It made him so mad he couldn't keep quiet. I bet I know where they went, he cried, jumping out from behind the tree stump and nearly scaring Kenny and Lizzie out of their skins. You followed me, said Kenny. Torrin ignored this. We have to find them, he said. I can help. It's no use, said Lizzie. They have run away together. She took hold of her hair and stuffed it down into her collar to keep the wind from blowing it around. I always knew they liked each other in a special way. You could just tell. Where would they go? Kenny asked. Some place cozy, Lizzie said, where they could set things up like a real home. It would be so much fun, she said wistfully. But they're only thirteen, said Kenny. That doesn't matter. This is a whole new world. The rules aren't the same. You're being dumb, Torrin said. That is not what Lena would do. I know that. She wouldn't leave Poppy just to go off with Dune. I know she wouldn't. You're too young to understand, said Lizzie. I am not, Torrin glared at her. I know what they did, he said. They were sick of being cold and not having enough to eat, so they went off to be roamers. 
to go someplace else and get away from everything. I bet someone in town has a wagon missing and an ox. I bet they went toward the old city because Lena knew the way from when she went before. Kenny listened to these ideas without saying anything much. Possible, but not right, he thought. Even though Torin lived in the same house as Lena, and Lizzie had known both Lena and Dune and Ember, neither one seemed really to know them very well. Lizzie and Torin argued back and forth. Lizzie said again that Torin was too young to understand, and talked about someone named Looper back in Ember that she would have gone off with if he'd asked her to, and Torin said that anybody would want to be a roamer if they could, even if they had to steal a wagon to do it, and that his brother Casper was a roamer, and that when he was old enough, he and Casper would be a team. Finally, Lizzie turned to Kenny. You're not saying anything, she said. Who do you think is right, me or him? Well, I think neither one, said Kenny. What I think is, they wanted to be helpful. There's hardship here, just the way there was hardship in their city before, and they wanted to help then. Lizzie and Torn both stared at him and said nothing for a moment. Then Lizzie said, You might be right. Might be, said Torn. So, if they wanted to help, Lizzie went on, where would they go? Some place where they could find things we don't have. But where is that? No one around here has anything. Kenny looked up at the sky, thinking. He rubbed his chin. If he wanted to help, what would he do? Where would he go? Maybe up north, he said. Maybe they caught a ride with that roamer who was here. But once they got here, how could they buy things, said Lizzie. They had nothing to trade with. That's true. Lizzie frowned, thinking. Maybe the ancient ruined city? Maybe when Lena went there, she saw things that were still left. No, said Torin. If there had been good things still there, Casper would have brought them back. They were stumped. They stood there in the cold alley, their ears and tips of their noses getting more and more chilly. Lizzie wound her scarf around her head. She coughed. It's so much colder here than it was in Ember, she complained. And the air here isn't just cold. It moves and slices into you. Which makes it worse. She coughed again, a raspy cough that made her eyes water. And in Ember, she went on, no water or ice falls out of the sky the way it does here. And even though people got sick there, at least they had medicine that sometimes helped a little bit. In Ember, she stopped. Oh, she said. Oh, what? Said Torin. I think I know where they went, said Lizzie. To Ember, Kenny cried. I bet you're right. But is anything left there? <clears throat> Might be, said Lizzie. At least a little bit. Probably more than here. Then that's it. That's where they went. Kenny felt sure of it. <clears throat> it felt right for both Lena and Dune. They wanted to help. They knew their old city. And they were brave enough to try to go there on their own. So what should we do? Lizzie said. Go after them and tell them it's too dangerous and they should come back? Is it dangerous? Kenny asked. It must be, Lizzie said. It's dark there now. And how would they even get in? They couldn't go up that river. She swiped at her runny nose. I think their minds must have got a little bit unhinged by the cold and the trouble here and everything. We should rescue them, cried Torin. I don't mind going out into the wilderness. It will be good practice for when I'm a roamer. <clears throat> but we don't know the way, said Kenny. I could remember it, maybe, Lizzie said. It's up there. She waved her hand in a vague northeasterly direction. We can't catch up with them, Kenny said. They've been gone too long. Maybe they're already on their way back. 
Or maybe they've had an accident and they're stuck out there. If we went up on the hill beyond that far field, we might see them. Then we could go and help. Torin was jumping up and down by now, his eyes shining and coat flapping. We have to go soon, he cried. But not in the night. Lizzie wrapped her jacket closer around her. Tomorrow, said Kenny. We could meet at the far field early, right at sunrise, okay? We'll just go up and look. Okay, cried Torin. We'll go tomorrow. He jumped up and thumped the wall with his fist. A few yards away, a window was pushed open, and in a moment, Ben Barlow poked his head out. What's all that commotion, he called. But no one was there. End of chapter 15. <clears throat> all right. Chapter 16. A Night with Mags. All right, said Mags. Now I'll show you where I got that book. She had dropped Lena's picture message from the cliff and come back. The sky was growing rapidly darker, and the sun was setting, and the rain clouds rising. So Mags unhooked a lantern from the side of her wagon. It was a tin can lantern with a candle burning inside, much like the lanterns used in Sparks. Follow me, she said. She headed for the grove of trees to the left of the cave entrance, the place where Lena had gathered kindling the night before. They went in among the thickets of brush and sticker bushes. It was in here somewhere, Mag said, stomping through the undergrowth. I wasn't the one who found it. That was Wash, but he showed it to the rest of us afterward. It was dark among the trees. Not much light from the sky filtered through. Mag's lantern made a spot of gold ahead of Lena, and she went fast to keep up with it. After a few minutes, the ground rose slightly uphill. Mag's edged between the thickly growing tree trunks, and Lena followed, her feet swishing through the deep layers of leaves. Here we go, said Mags. Lena came up behind her and saw what she'd glimpsed before a faint reflection glinting through the woods ahead. Now, watch your step, said Mags. We're close. A moment later, Mags cried, Ouch! And stopped so abruptly that Lena almost bumped into her. Stub my toe, Mags grumped. She kicked away some leaves, and beneath them Lena saw a step. Square-cornered, smooth, clearly man-made. And just beyond the step, the light glinted on metal. She stared in amazement. There was a door in the mountainside. It had a metal handle, and a metal border ran along its edges. The door swung open with a creak when Mags pulled on its handle. There might be bats or animals in here, Mags said. You better let me go in first. She stepped inside. No bats, no animals, she announced. So Lena followed her in. The lantern showed them a plain, windowless room, completely empty except for a small metal table that lay on its side on the floor. A few leaves, no doubt blown in by the wind, were scattered near the threshold. That was all. The book was in here, said Lena. There wasn't anything else in the room? Oh yes, said Mags. There was the jewel. Wash took that, of course. He gave me the book for starting fires. The jewel? Lena asked. What was the jewel? A diamond, Mag said. That's what Wash said it was. Just like in the song I sang you. Beautiful thing. He'll be able to get a good price for it someday. Lena was mystified and disappointed. The book must be about the jewel. But why would you need a book about a jewel? Jewels were just for decoration. Anyhow, the jewel was gone. There wouldn't be much to tell Dune after all. <clears throat> well, thanks for showing me, Lena said. You're welcome, said Mags. Now we need to get back to my wagon and get going, if we're going to make any progress at all before dark. 
They didn't make much progress. They walked for half an hour or so, and then the light was entirely gone from the sky. Time to set up camp, Mag said. Over there looks like a good place. Herding the sheep with shouts and pokes, she headed for a clump of low-spreading oak trees, and when the wagon was under their branches, she halted the horse that was towing it and unhooked his harness. <clears throat> What's the horse's name? Lena asked. Happy, said Mags. He doesn't look happy, Lena said. Well, he used to be. He's old, and it's hard to be happy when you're old. Lena wondered if this was true. She thought not. Her granny had been old, and she was usually happy. If this horse had enough to eat and didn't have to work so hard, she'd bet he'd be happy too. She gave his bony flank a pat. We'll make our fire right here, Mag said, hacking at the ground with the heel of one boot. Better do it quick before the rain comes. Get some kindling. Lena scurried around, gathering up grass and twigs and branches and carrying it all to Mag's. Soon, Mag's had built a sturdy stack with the kindling on the bottom and bigger sticks on top. Now to get a flame, she said. She took a couple of stones out of a little pouch attached to her belt. Wait, said Lena, I have a match. She took off her pack, reached inside, and pulled out a match. Mags looked at it greedily. How many have you got? she asked. I used up the one I got from you. I only have a few left, Lena answered. She was determined to guard them carefully. She'd practiced using flint stones to make a spark, but she wasn't very good at it. She didn't want to be left without matches. Even with a match, it was hard to get the fire going. The grass was damp from the rains of winter, and even when the flame caught, the wind kept blowing it out. Lena used up two more matches, relighting it. I never should have sold that book, Mag said. We could use it right now. It's terrible to burn a book, said Lena. You never know what might be in it. Mags just said, pfft, and shook her head. Finally, the fire burned more strongly. Now, said Mags, you watch it. I'll get the wagon ready. We're both going to have to cram inside tonight. She disappeared into the wagon again. It shook and rattled, and a pot, a skillet, a couple of tin boxes, and a big bucket all came flying from its rear end. I'll have to take more out later, Mag said when she emerged. It's pretty crowded in there. It's very unusual, Lena said. The wagon cover, I mean. So many colors. Like it? the rumor said. I made it myself. It's all pieces of old plastic and tin, bags, raincoats, umbrellas, flat cans, stuff like that. Been collecting it for years. They had some sort of gluey soup for dinner, slightly warmed up over the fire, and drunk out of cracked cups. Mag slurped hers noisily, and she talked as she slurped. For the next half hour or so, as they sat there by their small, sputtering fire, she hardly stopped talking at all. Mostly, she talked about her hardships. It was hard to find people who'd give you more than five sacks of corn for a sheep. It was hard to keep slogging back and forth between the mountain and the various miserable settlements around here. It was hard to control the sheep. If they wandered off, wolves could get them. It was hard to be out here in the winter weather, trying to find some old barn or abandoned house to take shelter in. That last big thunderstorm that came through nearly killed me, she said. I found an old stable to stay in, but water came in through the roof and put my fire out, and lightning hit a tree right next to the stable and burned it to the ground. She shook her stick at the sky, as if threatening whoever was up there making the weather. I am a kind and generous person and a devoted sister, she said, but enough is enough. At that moment, something called through the darkness. A long note that soared upward, fell and faded, and soared up again. Lena turned her head quickly. What's that? Wolves, 
said Mag. Mags, getting ready to hunt. I've never seen a wolf, said Lena. Well, lucky you, Mag said. It's a good idea to stay away from them. Have you seen that green star, the one that moves? Yes, said Lena. That's a weird one, said Mags. Never stays in the same place like a normal star. Disappears for days on end, then comes back, moves around, acts all wrong. But it isn't dangerous, is it? asked Lena. Maybe she should add it to her list of terrible things. Who knows? Mags drained her cup and wiped it out with the tail of her shirt. Might be, might not be. Clouds had blotted out the stars by now, and the wind was flinging down the first drops of rain. The sheep, which had been wandering and munching in a loose group, began huddling together, and soon they stood right up against each other, forming a big woolly mass. Got to get a new dog, said Mags, frowning at them. A dog, Lena said. Why? A dog would warn me if wolves were around. It would scare them off and protect the sheep. My old dog got bitten by a rattlesnake a couple months ago, and I haven't found a good replacement yet. Lena added rattlesnakes to her list of dangers. Do you know how to make a wolf scaring whistle? she asked, with a grass blade. Oh yes, Mag said. That helps sometimes. She pulled a stubby candle from one of the many bags tied onto her belt and lit it from the fire. Take this and climb in there, she said, pointing to the wagon. Quick, before you get wet. Lena took the candle in one hand and her pack in the other. She went over to the wagon's rear opening. She pushed aside a flap of the patchy cover and put one knee on the wagon and hoisted herself up. It was hard to do, holding the candle but she managed it. She pushed her pack in and crept inside. Ick, what a place. It was low and small and crowded and smelled like sheep sweat or sheep breath or something to do with sheep, and there didn't seem to be room in it for even one person, much less two. Stuff hung from hooks overhead and was packed in wads on the floor and against the sides and her candle made shadows behind every lump, in every cranny, next to every shelf and sack, and bunched up rag of clothing. Lena's heart sank, but she heard the pattering of rain on the wagon's tent, and she thought about how it would be to walk across the hills in the dark with the rain pounding down on her face and soaking her clothes. This is better, she thought. It's awful, but it's better. There were two more or less flat surfaces, which she guessed were where they would sleep. Basically, they were benches with blankets and other stuff piled on them. They were right next to each other along the length of the wagon, with only a few inches in between. She'd be sleeping very close to Mags, who had a powerful smell and might have bugs crawling on her, but there was no way around it. Lena spotted a small can with wax drippings on its sides. She stuck the candle in it to free up her hands. The wagon gave a lurch, and she staggered sideways and fell onto one of the benches. Mag's shaggy head appeared at the rear. That's right, she shouted. That one's yours. Rain is here. I'm coming in. At first, there really wasn't room for both of them at all. Lena scrunched up her knees and Mags banged around, shifting and shoving things, and stuff clattered down from hooks and shelves and bumped into Lena's head, and Mags grumbled and muttered, and the rain spattered even harder on the canvas roof. Some of this stuff, Mags said, I can just pitch out. She tossed a soup pot and a water bottle out into the night, and then a dishpan and some rubber boots and a broken three-legged stool. Might need these tonight, though. I'll keep them close. She reached up and tugged on something, and suddenly a flock of tin cans cascaded onto her head with a terrifying clatter. Mags didn't seem bothered. She lifted an arm, and Lena saw that the cans were all strung together in a bunch. What's that? she asked. It's to scare off wolves, Mags said. 
She shook the bunch, and the violent clatter sounded again. I made it myself. If we hear any wolf noises in the night, we just go out and shake these around. It usually works. It was a long and very uncomfortable night. The wind rocked the wagon, and drips of rain crept in through the seams of the canvas tent. Mag snored and groaned and thrashed around, jabbing Lena with an elbow now and then, and breathing rotten onion breath. Lena pressed as far from her as she could, up against the side of the wagon, and closed her eyes. But there was no peaceful darkness inside her mind. She was haunted by visions. Dune hauled away by the kidnappers. Embers smoke-filled and fire-lit. Dreadful strangers with flames on their heads. And the angry faces she expected to see when she got back to Sparks, having caused more trouble than the town already had. That same night, Kenny and Lizzie and Torin were also having trouble sleeping. They were listening unhappily to the rain. What if it didn't stop by morning? What if they couldn't go on their rescue adventure? All three of them really, really wanted to. And down in Ember, in the lair of the Trogs, Dune wasn't even trying to sleep. He was thinking as hard as he could, putting together in his mind everything he'd seen and heard during the day. Everything that might give him a clue about how to free himself. Finally, a possibility came to him. If he was wrong, he'd be in even worse trouble than now. But he thought he might be right. His heart started up a fast and steady thudding. End of chapter 16 I feel like this story has been very good about like leading leading us into like building up the story. It's done very well in this book. Get a little stretch in before we start the next chapter. It's always good to get a stretch, especially in the morning. All right. Okay, I need more caffeine too. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, chapter 17 The Secret of the Key. Dune waited until Trog's snore was steady. Skago had stopped whimpering, and everyone seemed soundly asleep. He sat up holding onto the chain so it wouldn't make a noise, he swung his legs off the side of the couch. He took off his shirt, and then his undershirt, which was made of old, soft, limp cotton, and he wrapped the undershirt around the chain, stuffing it into the cuffs around each of his ankles. Cautiously, he moved one foot just an inch. No clink. He put his shirt and jacket on, stuffed his scarf in his pocket, and stood up. He took his light cap from the floor, folded it around the candle, and put it in his other pocket. Then, with one tiny awkward step at a time, in total darkness except for the faint glow in the window from the low fire down in Harkin Square, he moved toward the door. There, he paused, all silent except for sounds of breathing and snoring. No one had heard him. He thought of the diamond in the closet. He had the strong feeling that the diamond was like a child stolen from its rightful parent. It needed to be rescued, and he was the one who should do it. The risk would be tremendous. If they heard him and stopped him, his chance for freedom might never come again. He had told Trog that he was not a thief, but the diamond was meant for the people of Ember. He was sure it was. So really, it was Trog who'd stolen it. Should he try to get it right now? He could hardly bear the thought of leaving it behind. But if he tried for it and was caught and lost his chance for freedom, then what? Standing there in the dark, he weighed these questions for several seconds. He chose freedom, finally, 
but in the back of his mind, he held on to a hope that he might return somehow and get another chance at the treasure that should be his. <clears throat> he turned the knob of the apartment door. It opened soundlessly. He went out and shut the door behind him. He sat down on the top step, and then, one soft, silent bump at a time, he went down the stairs on his seat. At the bottom, he pushed again with the shadow of the doorway, looking out into the square. There was Minnie, sitting with her back to him in a big armchair by the fire, with a stack of short sticks by her side and one long stick in her hand. She gave the fire a poke, and a few sparks flew up. Then she sat for a while without moving. Dune waited. Some minutes later, she reached down for a chunk of wood and tossed it on the fire. The flames caught it and danced a little brighter. Dune leaned against the stairway wall, determined to wait as long as it might take. It wasn't too long. After ten minutes or so, Minnie's head began to dip. It dipped down and jerked up, dipped again, jerked up. Finally, she lost the struggle. Her chin sank toward her chest. Dune saw the curve of her bony neck. Then she began to snore. A weak, sniveling snore. A sort of bubbly whine. <clears throat> now. Dune stepped out onto the pavement. He made his way toward Minnie, inch by inch. It took a long time. Once, she stopped snoring and sat up. Dune froze, but she only poked the fire feebly and slumped down again. Beside the fire, a few yards from her chair, the forks and knives and pots and pans from last night's dinner lay scattered on the ground. Barely breathing, Dune crept up to them. He chose the smallest knife. He slid it away from anything it might clank against and picked it up with two fingers. Then he moved on toward Minnie. Another dozen microscopic steps. He had to stop once to tuck the undershirt back around the chain when it began to come loose. Finally, he was standing behind her. Now. If his guess was right, this was the moment when he would know. It was her nervousness that had given him the clue, especially the way she had an attack of it every time she came near him. He had noticed that her hand fluttered up to her throat, that she clutched her chest, that she skittered away from him. Was it because she had the key? The dim firelight glinted faintly on the knob of greasy hair at the top of Minnie's head. Dune bent as close as he dared, holding his breath, peering at her bare, scrawny neck. His heart leapt. Right so far. Against the tendons of her neck lay a string. <clears throat> In one swift motion, he lifted the string from her skin, cut it, and pulled it away. And yes, there was the key. Minnie stirred. She slapped at her neck and muttered. Dune, grabbing the key, took a step back. If Minnie woke now and saw him, it was all over. But she slumped again and resumed her snoring. Dune backed up a few more steps, then bent over and fitted the key into the lock that held his chain. The lock opened. He unwrapped his shirt from the chain and pulled the chain, one careful link at a time, from the ankle cuffs. Just as he was straightening up to run, a chunk of wood in the fire dropped with a thump and a sizzle of sparks. That was the sound that brought Minnie awake. She sat up. She groped for her stick. Dune, standing only a few feet behind her, froze. If he moved now, she would turn around and see him. <clears throat> With her stick in her hand, Minnie stood up and took a step toward the fire. At the same time, with great caution, Dune took a step backward. Minnie pushed at the fire, moving the embers around, and as she did, Dune stepped back further. 
he had to reach the buildings and get out of sight, hide himself in a doorway before many turned and stay there until, or sorry, before many turned and stay there until she fell asleep again. He thought he had managed it. He'd gone far enough to feel a wall at his back. When she turned away from the fire, and she didn't look up as she went toward her chair and sank into it. Dune got ready to run. He'd go back to Greystone Street to pick up his pack, and then he'd head for the path that led up and out. His legs itched to get going. Then, Minnie, having done her first watch duty, seemed to recall her other duty. She raised a hand and patted her neck. She straightened up. She patted more quickly. She scrabbled at her neck with her fingers, pushing her hands under her collar and slapping at her chest. With a low moan, she sprang to her feet. Frantically, she peered at the ground around her chair. When she spotted the drop chain behind it, she let out a piercing wail. Oh, help, help, she cried. He's stolen the key. He's escaping. She grabbed a couple of pans and clanged them together. Bang, bang. The trogs would be jumping from their beds. Before Dune could form a thought, he heard their thumps and voices overhead. Running was impossible. He'd be seen and chased. So he ducked into the nearest doorway, the one next to the trog's apartment, and pressed himself back into the shadows and held still. It was no more than a minute before all three trogs thundered down the steps and out into Harkin Square. They'd thrown coats on over their nightshirts, and their shoes were unfastened. Yorick was in the lead. His hair stood up crazily. "'Which way did he go?' he yelled at Minnie. "'We know which way, Dunderhead,' Trog shouted. "'He's heading for the exit. Fan out, all of you. You too, Minnie. We'll all go toward the path, but take different streets. When you see him, give a shout.' <clears throat> he turned back toward the building. Dune flinched, but Trog wasn't looking in his direction. Scago, he shouted. Get down here and mind the fire. Then the four of them raced away. Dune took a long breath. He would have to find his pack and then hide somewhere until the Trogs gave up their search. That might take a long time. Disappointment drained his energy. He had wanted so badly to get out now. <clears throat> Overhead, he heard a sound, a scrape, then a pause, then a scrape, and a thump. A moment later, uneven footsteps on the stairs next door. Kabump, kabump. Dune peered from his doorway and saw Skago come out into the square. Dune, Skago whispered. I'm here, Dune whispered back. Skago limped over to him, going as fast as he could, carrying something. <clears throat> I heard you get up, Skago said breathlessly, and I watched you from the window. Then she yelled, and they all left, and the house was empty, so I got you this. He handed Dune a small yellow-wrapped bundle. Take it, quick. Dune's heart leapt. He knew what this was but he hesitated. You'll get in trouble, he said. No, I won't, said Skago. He'll think you took it. He smiled and handed Dune the bundle. Thank you for getting my treasures, he said. Dune laid a hand briefly on Skago's shoulder. I'll be back for you. Then, at last, he ran. At top speed, with the metal cuffs bouncing and scraping against his ankles, he ran up Gilly Street, around the corner onto Rockbello Road and into the deep shadow at the back of the gathering hall. Light from the fire shone faintly along the side streets, just enough to keep him oriented. <clears throat> First of all, he must find his pack. He had to have his generator, left behind when he was captured. He moved as quickly as he dared in the darkness, keeping his mind focused on exactly where he was. He drew his hand along the wall beside him. He counted the doorways. When he got to where he thought he left his pack, 
he swept his foot around in all directions, and at last he bumped against it. He grabbed it up, put the bundle Scoggo had given him inside, and slung the pack onto his back. His hands were sweating, and his heart was going so fast it was more like the, than a rattle than a beat. He gave himself a moment to think. He couldn't go toward the path, because the trogs would ambush him there. He'd have to wait for them to leave before he could get out of the city. But it occurred to him that he didn't have to waste time hunkering down in a dark apartment. There was something much more useful he could do. He would head for the pipeworks. End of chapter 17. McClellan, welcome in. Princess Luna Nightshade, welcome in. I love your name. Happy Thursday. How are you doing? I need another little stretch. We're going to see how long we can keep going. I'm hoping to go for about another hour. Good, a bit tired. I feel that 100%. Thank you for the hydrate. Let's go. I'm definitely going to hydrate with my caffeine of choice. I'm asleep for 30 more minutes. Oh my goodness. I wish I could sleep for another 30 more minutes. I wish I could. <clears throat> It's probably very early for you, though, so I understand that. I actually debated sleeping in an extra 30 minutes today, but I was like, no, I have to stream. <laughs> I have to read. But so far, it's been really, really good. Just tiring. <sighs> My kitty Luna kept waking me up last night because she wanted attention because I wasn't really home yesterday to give it to her. So she's not even hanging out with me right now while I'm here. She's so silly. Um, but let's see how many more chapters we can fit in this morning. Like I said, I'm hoping to go for about another hour at least before I have to go to work. Huh. <sighs> Maybe I'll take a, a nap <laughs> before work. We'll see. I still have to get ready for work. Make my, my lunch and everything. But let's keep going and see what happens with Dune. Chapter 18, In the Pipeworks. When he got to the pipeworks, its door stood partly open. Dune stepped inside and was instantly met by the smell of old rubber and mold, so familiar that it swept him backward in time. Everything looked the same as it had when he'd last been here. The slickers hanging on their hooks, the boots tumbled below, and he remembered his first day as a pipeworks laborer and how determined he had been to discover the secret of the generator and save the city by fixing it. The generator had been past hope by then, on its way to the complete death it was close to now. The way out of Ember had turned out to be very different from what he'd expected. Lighting his way with his own small generator, he started down the long stairway that led to the underground river. Even with the light from the bulb, the narrow steps were hard to see, and he had to go slowly and placed his feet with care so as not to slip. He couldn't help thinking, with a shudder, of the people who had died here. He was actually grateful that Trog had cleaned them up. It would have been dreadful to come upon them himself. It seemed a long time before he came out on the walkway beside the river, but when at last he did, the river's sound was the same as always, a thunderous churning as the water rushed between the stone banks, rising from the north end of the pipeworks and streaming away through the great mouth-like opening at the south end, and the hole he and Lena had sped through in their little boat. Dune paused by the river and tried to bring up the map of the pipeworks in his mind. He needed to picture the way to get through the maze of tunnels to that room where he'd found the mare asleep among the piles and piles of things he had stolen from the people of Ember. 
But the pipeworks was a different place now. The blackness beyond Dune's light, the roar of the unseeable river, and the sense of an endless emptiness in the twisting passageways. This was no longer the busy hive of activity it had been when he worked there. No human presence remained, except perhaps for the ghosts of those who had been lost in the tunnels long ago, or drowned in the river during the mad rush from the city. He took the third tunnel to the left off the main path by the river. Now, Dune told himself, I need the fourth opening in the right-hand wall. He made his way along. His generator made a bright circle, lighting the front of his jacket and the tops of his shoes and the walls to either side of him. But he couldn't see more than a few feet of head, which threw off his sense of distance. The pipes that ran along the walls and the ceiling were now, after nine months of neglect, in even worse shape than they had been. Water seeped down the walls and dripped from the ceiling. Every so often, his feet plunged into a puddle, and the water splashed up onto his legs. He began to feel unsure if he'd passed two tunnel entrances or three. He couldn't get a sense of the length of the passage he was in and how far he'd gone. When he came to what he thought was the fourth opening, he hesitated. What if he'd taken a wrong turn or missed an opening without realizing it? But his memory had not failed him. Minutes later, he went around a curve, and there it was. The tunnel that had been roped off when he first came across it. The rope was still there, but now one end of it was loose and lay on the ground. And when he went down the passage, he found that the door at the end stood open. He stepped inside and smiled. He had meant to leave the pipeworks after checking the mayor's room, but just as he came to the main pathway beside the river, the city took another shudder of its shuddering breaths. Dune heard the grinding and squealing of the ancient generator as its wheels and cranks started up, and overhead the lights blinked and came on. For a moment, everything looked as it used to. The main tunnel stretched in both directions, with the dark hollows of the smaller tunnels along it. On the rippling, rushing surface of the water, splinters of light glinted like darting fish. Dune stood on the riverbank, looking, remembering, and thinking. He came to a decision he knew was right. Quickly, before the lights would fade again, he ran along the river walk to the generator room. The one time he'd been in here before, the noise and confusion had been so overwhelming that he'd stayed only a few moments. Now he wasted no time gazing at the monstrous old machine. The first thing he did was kick through the litter of rusty old parts and abandoned tools lying on the floor until he found a screwdriver, <coughs> which he thrust into his pocket. Then he set down his own small generator and made right for the place where an arm of the great machine plunged into the river. He had to crawl on his knees into a narrow space between the whirring gears and the edge of the riverbank to get at it. A stout pipe, mottled with scum and rust, emerged from the generator's side, made a right-angle turn, and went straight down into the water. Where it entered, Dune could see something vast and dark and iron-looking under the surface, turning in halting jolts. It was the wheel that somehow caused the generator to create electricity. He would have to break off that pipe to disconnect the power of the river from the machine. He darted back to where their tools lay scattered and found a wrench that would do. Using his old pipework skills, which came back to him readily, he tightened the wrench around the joint of the connecting pipe and hauled at it as hard as he could. He nearly fell backward into the river. The pipe was so old and rotten that it came apart, crumbling into rough-edged flakes, and right away the gears of the, of the generator slowed and the light began to fade. In a moment, 
Dune stood in total darkness. The only sound was the rush of the river. No more water would be pumped up into the city, and the lights were gone for good. Before too long, the trogs would have to leave, which was as it should be. They didn't belong in Ember, and yet Dune felt a swell of sorrow. He had just killed his city. He felt the pain of it right in the center of himself, as if someone he loved had died. It was true, he thought. He had loved Ember, with all its problems, but Ember's time was over. <clears throat> now he faced a dilemma. The trogs were waiting for him by the exit path, determined not to let him get out and spread the word about their private underground kingdom. He wouldn't be able to get past them without being seen. Even if he did, he couldn't go up without a light, and they'd see the light. He had to keep them from following him and he was pretty sure he knew how to do it. He groped his way across the generator room, found his own generator by the door, and cranked its handle. By its light, he made his way back down the riverside path and started up the stairway. When he was nearly to the top, he took a fresh candle from his pack, lit it, and dripped some of its wax onto the step. He stuck the candle into the melted wax sat down on the step next to it, and took the screwdriver from his pocket. By the candle's light, he undid the ankle cuffs that Trog had fastened onto him. He gave his legs a quick rub. <clears throat> it felt great not to have the metal banging his bones and chafing his skin. Then he left the candle there. It would burn for an hour, and climbed the rest of the stairs. When he reached the locker room, he propped the door to the stairway open with a heavy bucket. He darted into the pipework's office and grabbed a key from a ring on the wall. Back in the locker room, he picked up a toolbox, the kind he used to use when he worked here, full of wrenches and hammers. <clears throat> he stepped outside onto the street and used the toolbox to prop the street door open too. Now came the tricky part. Cranking his generator just enough to light a few steps ahead, he made his way across Plummer Square to Livery Street. This would lead him to the area where the trogs were lying in wait, though he couldn't know exactly where they were. He stopped and stood still, listening. He heard no voices, no footsteps. With his hand against the wall, he crept further along. He had to be close to Blot Street now, this was far enough. He might run into one of them any moment. Dune took a quick breath. Here goes, he thought. He began to make the sound of running. He slapped his feet on the pavement, though he was not actually running, but staying just where he was. He panted loudly. I hear him, shouted Yorick from out in the darkness. He's over there, shouted Kanza. Get him! roared Trog. Dune gave a good loud yelp of fright. A few blocks ahead, he saw one of the Trogs, he couldn't tell which, come out of a doorway. He whirled around and ran, cranking his generator every few steps to keep his light going dimly. And when he got back to the pipework's door, he snatched up the toolbox and dumped its contents onto the street. The tools clanked and clattered. He kicked most of them aside, as if hastily trying to hide them. Then, leaving the pipework's door open and giving the key a quick twist in the knob, he dashed across the street and crept partway up the stairs behind a shop. He sat there, utterly still. "'The noise came from this way,' shouted the voice of Yorick. "'Come on, all you slow pokes, faster!' That was Trog. Dune heard shoes slapping the pavement, and around the corner came the four headlights of the trogs, joggling through the darkness. Here, yelled Yorick, tripping over the sadder tools. He dropped his weapons. Wait, noodlehead, cried Trog. It's a trick. He wants us to think he's in there, and he's not. But Yorick had already dashed inside. Wrong, Pa, he shouted. I see his light. He's on his way down those stairs. 
At that, the whole family rushed inside, Kanza yelling in glee, Minnie scuttling along last. June, quick and silent, crossed the street and closed the pipeworks door behind them. He had, of course, used the key to set the knob in the locked position. By the time the trogs broke down the door to get out, there were plenty of hammers and wrenches in there to attack it with, but still, it should take them at least an hour. He would be a good way up the path out of their reach. <coughs> he made for Deeple Street. At the edge of the unknown regions, he exchanged his generator for a candle, which he fitted into his light cap. Several minutes of fast walking brought him to the chasm, which he crossed with quick, careful steps, keeping his mind blank. On the other side, he gave the boards of the bridge a push so that they fell into the pit. Trog could jump the pit, he knew, but still this might slow him down a little. Like Lena, Dune noticed the cans and bottles that had been dropped to mark the way of the, to the path. He followed their trail, going as fast as he could, and aiming a hard kick at each one as he passed, sending it skidding off into the darkness. Another way to slow down Trog. When he felt fatigue creeping up on him, he pictured the Trogs battering down the pipework's door, and that gave him the strength to keep going. The climb up the path was arduous and long. He burned one candle after another on the way, but no one pursued him as far as he could tell. He got safely to the top and edged through the crack to the outside. It was dark, but he could tell from the faintness of the, star of the stars that day was near. He needed to rest, even just for a few minutes, before he could go on. But first, he had to look at what Skago had given him. He took off his pack, felt inside for the bundle, pulled it out, and unwound the yellow cloth. There was the diamond, glimmering in the dim light that was not yet dawn. He ran his hand over its glassy surface. He turned it upside down and saw twists and turns and tabs of metal within its circular collar. He didn't really know what this diamond was any more than Trog did, and there was no time to examine it now, but he was sure he could find out. He felt grateful to Skago for giving it to him even a bit grateful to Trog for finding it in the first place. The diamond was meant to be his, though these unlikely people, it had come to him after all. End of chapter 18 Another good stretch. We are crushing this book today. I'm hoping that after we finish today, the next reading stream will maybe finish the book. We'll see. There's still quite a bit left. So it, it could be one or two more, um, one or two more reading streams a bit. But I can't wait to see what happens. Let's see how long this next chapter is. Okay, we might be able to go through two more chapters today at least. So let's keep going. Chapter 19. Across the Empty Lands. Lena opened her eyes and remembered that she was in the wagon with Mags the shepherd. The pattering of the rain had stopped, but it still seemed to be night. Quietly, she sat up and crept down the bench on her knees to look out the back. She could see a faint pink light at the line where the mountain met the sky, so it was almost morning. Mags was sleeping with her mouth hanging open and a string of drool on her chin. It would be a while before she could get moving, Lena knew. She didn't have time to wait. She put on her jacket and picked up her pack, but it bumped against the side of the wagon as she was trying to get her arms into the straps. The, the, sorry, the wagon jolted. A plate fell off a shelf, and Mags woke. Watch out, she shouted. Robbers! Sheep burglars! She shouted and conked her head on a tent beam. It's only me, Lena said. I'm leaving. Thank you for helping me. 
You're leaving? said Mags, rubbing her head. Yes, Lena said. I have to get home. Don't be in such a hurry, Mags said. She wiped the drool from her chin with the corner of her blanket and looked around blearily. I just need to get my clothes on, put a little breakfast together, round up the sheep and feed the horse, and I'll be ready to go. Lena shook her head. I can't wait, she said. I have to get home fast. I can walk faster than your wagon and sheep can go. You can't go by yourself, said Mags. I'll go with you. There's wolves around. They won't bother me, Lena said. Don't be silly, said Mags, yawning. Get yourself some breakfast. I'll be up in a minute. She lay back down and pulled up her blanket. I don't need any breakfast, Lena said. Right over there, said Mags, as if she hadn't heard, waving a hand at some bags on the floor. Carrots, nuts, dry sheep cheese. She closed her eyes and pulled a pillow over her head. Lena opened the bags and took some of the food. Fill your water bottle from the rain bucket, Mags mumbled from under the pillow. Then wait for me. I'll be right here. In a moment, she was snoring again. Outside, it was chilly and still quite dark in spite of the faint pink glow in the east. Lena filled her water bottle and put the food in her pack. She had no intention of waiting for Mags. Already, she was too far to the south. To keep from getting lost on the way home, she needed to head back the way they'd come for a while and get to a spot that was familiar before turning toward Sparks. She could be well on her way before Mags even woke up. She waved at the sheep, who were huddled together in one big clump, and she stroked the side of Happy the horse, who swung his head around to look at her sadly. Goodbye, she whispered, and she started up the slope, heading northeast back toward Ember. As she walked, she made a plan. There was that rock like a shoulder heaving out of the ground, she recalled. It was ten minutes' walk or so from the entrance to Ember, and it was near the stream. If she headed for that rock, then she could follow the stream and be sure she was going the right way home. Wind blew her hair sideways, and she reached back to braid it as she walked, tying the end with a thread she pulled from the rabbling hem of her shirt. Rest and food had given her energy, and she wanted to be going fast. She burned with impatience, but the long wet grass and soft ground slowed her steps, and she couldn't see very well in the dim light. She was sure it was just as early as it had been when she and Dune had started out from Sparks, maybe even earlier. She should get home, if nothing went wrong, before the end of the day. It wasn't soon enough. It meant a whole day and night of captivity for Dune, but it was the very best she could do. So she strode across the hillside as quickly as she could, munching on one of the carrots, with her damp pant legs slapping against her skin. The sun will be up soon, she told herself. Then I can go faster. That same morning, just at sunrise in the village of Sparks, Kenny, Lizzie, and Torin met by the field at the far north end of town. The nighttime rain had stopped, and the first red rays of the sun shot over the mountain's rim, lighting the eastern side of each dry stalk of grass and clod of dirt in the field, and each fence post at the field's edge. It was cold, but no one minded. They had bundled up well, and they were excited by their mission, to rescue Lena and Dune and to have an adventure of their own. It was a Saturday, so they didn't need excuses for skipping school, only for their families. Torn had told Mrs. Murdo and Dr. Hester that he had to go and talk to Dune about a very important matter, which was more or less true, and that he'd be back pretty soon. Lizzie and Kenny had both simply said that they were going for a walk and their parents let them go without questions. The three of them went around to the end of the field and started up the hill. Each wore a small backpack in which they brought bottles of water, 
and hunks of bread and dried fruit in case Lena and Dune were starving. Lizzie had also brought two extra scarves in case they were cold. Kenny, who had lain awake thinking about this venture most of the night, had stuffed his pockets with some scraps of cloth torn from an old red shirt. He planned to drop one of these every now and then as they walked and to anchor it to the ground with a stone or a stick driven through it so that when they came back, they could follow the scraps and not get lost. He was a little worried about getting lost. Lizzie had washed her hair the night before and then brushed it for a long time. Today, instead of braiding it, she let it flow loose over her shoulders, which she knew made her look more beautiful. She had also rubbed her arms and neck with dried lavender, which made her smell good. She did these things because somewhere in the back of her mind was the notion that Dune, who always seemed to be doing something important, something other people admired him for, might want a girl companion who was a little more fascinating than Lena. If Dune was going to be a hero, he needed someone special by his side. Lizzie had always thought of herself as rather special. Even her illness hadn't diminished her good looks. In fact, she thought the thinness of her face and the hollows around her eyes made her look more interesting. I hope nothing terrible has happened to them, she said, panting slightly as they approached the crest of the hill. What if they have frostbite? What if one of them has a broken leg or something? She imagined Dune limping on his mangled leg, putting his arm around her shoulders for support. No. First she would need to tie up the broken bone somehow with the extra scarf she'd, she'd brought. I'm so grateful, Dune would say. It's a miracle that you were here. At the top of the hill, they stopped to get their breath and to look around. Behind them was their village. Wisps of smoke rose from chimneys, and a few people, breathing clouds of steam, hurried across yards or trudged down streets. The sun was just beginning to hit the east sides of the, of the rooftops. A few windows flashed golden in the strong early light. From here, Sparks looked like a calm and contented village, not one harrowed by sickness and hunger. Pretty soon things will get better, said Kenny. Uh-huh, said Lizzie, who was imagining how it would be to come into town with Dune holding her arm and everyone seeing that she had saved him. Come on, let's go, said Torin. This was one of the few chances he'd had to be away from where he lived, and he wanted to make the most of it. Rumors didn't stand around looking back at the place they'd just left. They moved on. Ahead stretched one line of hills after another, each ridge higher than the last, rolling toward the mountains in the distance. It was a vast and empty landscape, and when they contemplated it, each of the three travelers felt a shiver of doubt. Which way do we go? Kenny asked Lizzie. Lizzie wasn't sure, but she didn't want to say so. It's sort of that way, she said, waving a hand out to the right. After a while, you get to a stream, and then you just follow that. See those trees, said Kenny, the ones that look like a hand? He pointed to a clump of oaks that grew in a sort of mitten shape near the top of a hill that, uh, about three ridges away. Let's aim for there. We can see a lot from that high, and I think it looks close enough so we can get home before dark. So they set out, downhill this time, across fields of wet grass. Lizzie scanned the landscape for anything that looked familiar, but nothing did. At the same time, everything did, because it all looked the same. She was pretty sure they were going the right way, but still she was glad that Kenny set down his red rag markers every now and then, just in case. All three of them slipped or stumbled sometimes, because they were not looking at the ground they walked on, but scanning the slopes all around searching for any sign of Lena and Dune. But even after an hour of walking, when the sun had finally risen, and their feet were already starting to hurt from rubbing against their shoes, they saw no sign of anything moving anywhere 
in the landscape, except far off in the distance, some birds with motionless wings floating in circles in the sky. End of chapter 19. All right. I wonder if we can get through two more chapters. We might be able to. We might be able to get through two more chapters today. Let's get another stretch. Chapter 20, The Battle at the Rock Once he had rewrapped the diamond and put it back in his pack, Dune's first thought was of Lena. She couldn't have traveled during the night. There was a chance she might still be nearby, might just now be starting her journey to Sparks. How could he find out? He would have to get up high and look out over the hills to the west. Even in the near dark, it wasn't hard. He scrambled up the mountainside, finding roots and jutting rocks for handholds and footholds, until he came to a place flat enough to stand on. He turned around. The folds of the hills lay before him, receding into darkness. Was she out there? He filled his lungs with air and shouted, Lena! Lena! Hello? 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 Would she hear him? Was she so far away that his voice might seem nothing more than the wind or the cry of an animal? He waited, hearing no answer. Weariness overcame him. He might as well rest here a moment, he thought, before starting home. He sat down on the ledge with his back against the rock. His eyes closed, and when they opened again, the sky was lighter, though the sun was still behind the mountain. He stood up and called again. Lena, are you out there? Lena, hello? And then he realized there was something else he could do. He slung his pack off, reached into it, and pulled out his generator. In a moment, his light was shining. Dune's shouts flew out through the cold morning air and across the fields. Lena didn't hear the first one. She was still too far away. But she heard the second one. Though it came from a distance, she knew it was a human voice. Her heart jumped. Was it Dune? She had been walking now for half an hour and was within sight of the shoulder-shaped rock. She raced toward it, stumbling over clumps of wet grass. Dune, she called. Is it you? Call again. Call again. The voice rang out. Hello? 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 The ember mountain loomed huge and dark against the sky. But toward its base, she saw a dot of light. A bright, steady light that could only be one thing. I'm here, she yelled at the top of her lungs. I'm coming. But had he heard her? Could they find each other? With the wind at her back, she made her way to the great rock and climbed up its sloping side to the top. Here, she shouted again and waved her arms. Dune! Dune! This way! He's out of the city, she thought. We're all right now. We'll find each other and go home together. She saw his light move, fade, and go out. He must have heard her then. He'd put the light away and was coming. Lena waited on the rock. Little by little, the sky grew brighter at the edge of the mountain, though the mountain's shadow still darkened the fields. Every few minutes she called out, and she heard Dune's answering call grow closer. There was another sound, too. What was it? A sound of rustling, a sound of breathing. And then suddenly... Right below her, a growl. She looked down to see three long, lithe, shadowy shapes in the grass. Animals. Their tails twitched. 
Their heads were like spear points aimed in her direction. Dune had heard Lena's answer to his call, and with huge relief had made his way down the mountainside and started toward her. He put away his generator and strode as fast as he could out into the fields. He thought she must be near the big humped rock that thrust up from the ground, near where the stream made a bend. For a while they called back and forth. He guided himself by her voice, and soon he could see her, still small in the distance, standing on top of the rock and waving. His spirit rose. He forgot for the moment how tired he was and hurried on, almost running. Behind him, the sky grew lighter. Lena wasn't calling anymore, probably because she could tell that he knew where she was. He went down the slope of a hill, losing sight of the rock for a moment, and veered slightly to the right and then up again, until the big rock looked hardly more than a five-minute walk away. That was when he heard the scream, and with the scream came another sound, a sudden frenzy of barking. He stopped, baffled. Dogs? Why would there be? Then he remembered. Wolves were like dogs, Kenny had said. Wolves would bark. His heart jolted, and he dashed forward. Another scream rang out, and Dune gave a shout in answer, too breathless and panicked to form words. He ran, stumbling, until he was close enough to see what was happening. Lena, on top of the rock, and below her, the wolves, stretching their long faces upward, growling and snapping their jaws. Dune's knees went loose, but he willed himself to stay standing. He knew Lena had seen him. She was gazing at him with horrified eyes, too frozen with fear to call out. He was on a slight rise, perhaps fifty feet from the base of the rock, behind the wolves and a little above them. Their growling was terrible. It came from deep in their throats, a sound charged with threat and power. As he watched, one wolf darted forward from the rest. It rose on its hind legs, and suddenly it was immensely tall, its front feet reaching up on the slope of the rock only a yard or so from Lena's shoes. Could wolves climb? Could they jump the distance up to Lena? Would they at any moment circle the rock and climb up the slope behind her? Somehow he must scare these creatures away. He had no weapon but his own voice. He gathered his strength and gave her a tremendous shout, packed with all his fear and horror. The wolves heard him and looked in his direction. Now he could see their faces clearly. The long, narrow mouths jagged with teeth the slanting yellow eyes. He shouted again, and this time called, Lena, scream at them, make noise, throw rocks. The word noise jogged his memory, and he reached down and yanked up a blade of grass. In a second, he had what Kenny had called a wolf-scaring whistle. He blew, making a long, ragged shriek. The wolves glowered at him, but they did not retreat. Lena yelled, and the wolves turned back toward her. Without taking her eyes from them, she bent her knees and clawed at the rock beneath her, scratched away a handful of loose stones, and flung them down. For a moment, the wolves fell back, but only for a moment. Then all three animals leapt upward again, snarling and yelping, and Dune forgot his own safety and ran forward, yelling out terrible noises flinging his arms about wildly. He stumbled, his foot twisted, and he felt a quick pain, but ran on, hardly noticing. If only he had a weapon, even a stick, but he had nothing, nothing, and Lena was in peril, and he was getting so close that at any moment he would be among the wolves himself. If he could only somehow frighten them, scatter them, he stopped short. His pack thumped against his back, and he ripped it off and reached in and pulled out the diamond. In one quick motion, he tore aside its yellow wrap. There was a split second when a needle of grief pierced him. 
Then he flung the diamond with all his might into the midst of the wolves. But the diamond missed the wolves and struck the rock. It shattered into a million pieces, an explosion of glass splinters. The wolves yelped, ducked their heads, and staggered backward. Once again, Dune yelled, and so did Lena, kicking down more stones. The wolves backed away, giving quick, violent shakes to their heads, still growling. Dune saw that their gray coats were thin and patchy. The stripes of their ribs showed on their sides, and on their faces and shoulders was the faintest sparkling where the light caught bits of the shattered diamond. One of them seemed to make a decision. It trotted a short distance away and looked back, and the others, with a last glance at Lena, followed. They loped off down the hillside to the north, and in a few moments they had vanished over the crest of a ridge. Dune took in a long, trembling breath. He stood where he was, suddenly weak. As Lena climbed down from the rock and started toward him, "'Are they gone?' she cried. "'Are you all right?' "'Yes,' said Dune, though he found he couldn't say it very loudly, and as soon as he took a step, a pain shot up his leg. His knees folded, and he crumpled to the ground. Behind him, the sun at last rose above over the mountains. Light flooded the sky, spilled out over the grassy hills, and glittered on the chips of glass that lay scattered over the ground below the rock. The Remains of the Diamond End of Chapter 20All right, let's see. Let's see if we can read one more chapter for today. So I get one more stretch in. We need these in between chapter stretches. <clears throat> one more hydrate of caffeine. And we're good to go. Okay. Chapter 21. Lena ran to Dune and collapsed beside him. The energy of terror drained suddenly away, and she felt as if her whole self had turned to jelly. For a moment, she couldn't speak. She sat there in the wet grass, breathing in long shudders. Dune turned to her. You aren't hurt, are you? She shook her head. Good, he said. The wind blew against the side of Lena's face, and she shivered. What was that you threw at them? she asked. I'll tell you about it, Dune said, in a minute. Far up in the sky, big birds flew in circles without moving their wings. Lena remembered. They followed the wolves and picked over what was left. Go away, birds, she thought. There's nothing for you here. <clears throat> I'm going to go get my pack, she said after a while. I left it on the ground behind the rock. Dune just nodded. Lena went, and as she came back, she saw Dune getting to his feet. But as soon as he stood up, he staggered and fell. She heard him give a grunt of pain. What's wrong, she said when she came up to him. My ankle, he said. I think I twisted it. Can you walk at all? I don't know, he said. They stood up, and Dune held on to Lena's arm. At the very first step, he gasped when his foot touched the ground, and yanked it up again. It's not too bad, he said. Maybe in a little while. Maybe after I've rested some. No, Lena said. We can't make it back to, st to Sparks by tonight. We mustn't even try. We'd have to go too slowly. Dark would come, and we'd be stranded out in the middle of nowhere. Dune closed his eyes. He lay back on the ground with his face to the sun. He looked as if he was going to sleep. Lena jiggled his arm gently. We need a plan, she said. We have to get away from here. What if the wolves come back? Dune sighed and sat up again. 
propping himself on his hands. I know where we can go, Lena said. Come on, lean on me. Hop on your good leg. Dune struggled to his feet and put his pack on. He laid an arm around Lena's shoulders, and together they started across the hill, back the way they'd come. The wind came at them from behind now, blowing their hair into their faces, and the morning sun glared in their eyes. June was silent the whole way, and Lena worried. Could he have broken his ankle bone? If he tried to walk on it, what would happen? But if he couldn't walk, then she was back where she started, having to go for help alone. They headed uphill. It was a long, hard walk. Dune hopped and limped, and every several steps he had to pause just to give himself a rest from the pain. They reached the cave entrance at last, but Lena turned away and led Dune through the thicket of trees to the room that Mags had showed her. He would want to see it, she was sure. This is where the book was, she said, that book you brought from the roamer. This is where they found it. The room was just the same as when Lena had seen it before. The smooth walls, the overturned table, the few dry leaves scattered across the floor. Dune looked around. Lena had thought he'd be excited, but he seemed too tired even to be interested. She spread out her blanket and they sat down. Those wolves, Lena said, they scared me right down to my bones. They were hungry, said Dune. Yes, I think I smelled like a sheep to them. You do have sort of a sheepy smell, Dune said. So Lena explained about Mags, that she was the roamer who'd come to Sparks, and also the shepherd she'd stayed with last night, and also Trog's sister, who had been delivering food to his family. The lamb, said Dune. We ate it last night. He told Lena about seeing her tricky note, and how relieved he was to know that she was out safely. Did you eat any breakfast this morning? Lena asked. No, said Dune. I've been up all night. A lot has happened. I have to tell you about it. Yes, said Lena. We'll eat and talk. From her pack, she took the food Mags had given her. Here, she said, handing him some dry cheese and carrots and crackers. It's kind of strange food, but it tastes all right. So Dune and Lena ate, and he told her what had happened, how he'd gotten the key from Minnie, how Skago had helped him escape, and how he'd cut Ember's power and trapped the trogs in the pipeworks. Lena was worried by something in his voice, a sadness, a hopeless tone that wasn't like him. Are you afraid Trog might be coming after you? she asked. He might, said Dune, but if he does, I'll just tell him the truth, that I disconnected the generator so no more water will come from the pipes, and no more light from the lamps. He'll know he doesn't have a fortress to protect anymore. But wouldn't he be furious about that? And maybe try to punish you somehow? He'd be furious, but I don't think he'd actually hurt me. Unless... Dune trailed off. We'll listen for voices or footsteps, he said, and close the door of this room if we hear any. For now, they left the door open. Day was brightening outside and they could see the sunlight coming through the tree branches and hear the birds first twittering. We'll stay here today and tonight, Lena said. Tomorrow, I'm sure your foot will be better and we'll go home. Everything will be fine. Dune nodded slightly, staring into the air. Really, said Lena, it's all okay. There's something else I haven't told you, said Dune. <clears throat> there was a diamond. He told her the story. It was what we came here looking for, he said. It's what the book was about. The jewel, Lena said. Mags told me they found the book and the jewel together in this room. Nothing else was in here but those two things. And now the diamond is gone, Dune said. It's what I threw at the wolves. Hello! Thank you for six months. Welcome in. Happy Thursday. 
I don't know why my sub goal isn't changing. <laughs> it hasn't changed today. I'll have to fix it. Thank you so much. We're almost done for today. We have a few more pages to read and then we'll hopefully be writing out. I'm so sorry for interrupting your reading. No worries. No worries. Thank you so much. I'm hoping you're having a good day so far. Let me just get through this chapter and then we'll we'll kind of hang out for a little bit. <clears throat> okay. And now the diamond is gone, Dune said. It's what I threw at the wolves. I had such a strange feeling about it that it was supposed to come to me. Maybe the reason was so I could use it to save you. That seems like a good reason to me, Lena said. I'm going to go find some wood, she added. We'll need to make a fire later on. Kenny, Lizzie, and Torin had been walking for a long time now. The sun was past the noon position. Torin wasn't enjoying himself anymore. He hadn't done this much walking since the town hall burned down, and he almost burned with it. Would have, if it hadn't been for Dune. He'd scorched his feet in that fire, and even though they had healed now, a hike like this brought the soreness back. This wasn't turning out to be the thrilling adventure he had imagined. There wouldn't be any roamers out here, he said, because there's nothing to collect and nobody to sell it to. It's boring. But roamers have to cross land like this, Kenny said. This is what's between one place and another. Torn frowned. How much farther to those trees? At the moment, they were down in a valley between ridges of hills, so they couldn't see the clump of trees that was their destination. Maybe it was farther away than it had looked. It did seem to be taking a long time to get there. Well, we don't have to go all that way, said Kenny. He was a little tired himself. We could just go to the top of this next hill. Probably we can see a long way from there. No one objected to this. They climbed with renewed energy, and before long they came out on the wide, rounded crest of the hill, where the wind blew more strongly, and the hills beyond looked steeper and rockier. They gazed in all directions. Empty lands, everywhere. Should we eat some of the food we brought? said Torin. They aren't here, so we don't need to save it for them. We should eat it, Lizzie said. Her hair was tossing in the wind getting all messed up and slapping at her face. Or most of it, anyway. We ought to save a little, just in case they show up. She was very disappointed not to see Dune out in the distance, limping toward them, with Lena following helplessly behind, or maybe not with them at all. Sitting down to eat some lunch would be a good thing in two ways. It would give them a rest, and it would give them more time to see Dune and Lena if they were really out there. So the three of them took the bread and dried fruit and water bottles from their backpacks, and then they put their packs on the ground and sat on them. They didn't talk much as they ate it. It looked as if they had failed in their mission, and they were not feeling cheerful. "'You smell funny,' Torrin said to Lizzie. "'I do not,' Lizzie said. "'Anyway, it's not a smell. It's a scent. It's enticing. But you wouldn't understand.' You think you're so... But Kenny interrupted him. Look, he said, pointing. Someone's out there. They jumped to their feet and squinted into the distance, against the sun. They all had the same thought. Our mission will be a success after all. But they soon saw that it wasn't a lone traveler, but someone accompanied by animals in a wagon. The little caravan was moving south. It's not them, said Lizzie. Nope, said Kenny. But maybe whoever it is has seen them. Let's shout, cried Torin. They yelled as loud as they could, jumped up and down, waved their arms. The traveler in the distance reached the crest of the hill where the clump of oaks grew that the rescuers had been aiming for themselves. Person, wagon, and animals seemed about to disappear down the other side. Louder, screamed Torin, and they yelled with all their might. The faraway traveler paused, turned, paused again. Torin had an idea. 
Lift me up, he cried to Lizzie and Kenny. Quick, do a chair with your arms. They did, and he leapt up, standing twice as high as his regular height, and waved and screamed some more. And the traveler, followed by the caravan, turned and started in their direction. They're coming, cried Torin. He jumped down. Hurry, cried Kenny. Let's go. They grabbed up their things and shouldered their packs. They ran, still waving their arms and shouting, and soon they were sure. The person had seen them, too, and was steering the wagon and animals toward them. I think it's a roamer, cried Torin. Isn't it? The person stalking toward them held a long stick and flailed it around, shouting, Get going, flop ears, over here, this way. Move those pointy little feet. A shepherd, said Kenny. A woman. Doesn't she look kind of familiar? Lizzie said. Wasn't she the one who came to town last week with the mangy sheep? Yes, said Kenny. I think you're right. Hey there, called the shepherd as she drew near. She and her wagon looked like a traveling junk pile, clanking and creaking. The sheep's legs were black with mud. The shepherd strode up to them and pointed her stick at them. Who are you? she said. Why are there so many children wandering around out here? Kenny stepped forward and spoke up. We're looking for our friends, he said, who might be in trouble. One is Lena and one is Dune. Lena, said the shepherd. Long, dark hair, tall and skinny, very quick in the way she moves. Yes, cried all three rescuers. She was up there by the mountain with a cave in it, on her way home, said the shepherd. I'm surprised you haven't met up with her by now. But wasn't there a boy with her? Lizzie asked. Brown hair, dark eyebrows, serious looking, handsome. She was looking for a boy, said Mags. He was down in there. Down in where? Kenny said. Down in that city, in that cave. Mags pressed her lips together and frowned, as if she might say more about this, but chose not to. It was Dune, cried Kenny. It has to be, Torn said. We have to help him, Lizzie cried. We have to go and get him. Lena, too, of course. But it's late, Kenny pointed out. It's too far to go. I'm sure it is. Dark would come before we got there. That's right, it would, said Mags. Her sheep nudged up behind her, making mournful noises. She shook her stick at them. Are you three from the town called Sparks? They said they were. If you're going to get home before dark, you'll have to hurry, said the shepherd. You're off course. You've come too far south. You don't want to be out here at night. Go tell your people to get up there and rescue those two kids. We can't rescue them ourselves, said Lizzie, disappointed. No, said the shepherd firmly. Then let's go, said Kenny, as fast as we can. So the three of them turned around and headed back to Sparks. The shepherd, with her scrawny horse, her rattling wagon, and her wayward sheep, turned southward again and trundled on. End of chapter 21